Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little bit about adfreeshows.com. People often ask me, what exactly is adfreeshows all about? Well, I'm glad you asked. Not only do you get early ad-free access to all of my podcasts starting at just $9, but you also get many of your other favorite wrestling podcasts like Click This with Kevin Nash, Gentleman Villain with William Regal, Oh You Didn't Know with Brian James, and others for, yes, still just $9 a month. That's 14 podcasts in total every single week, early with no ads. That's like 20 cents an episode. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple Podcasts or through your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Want some more cheese on that Whopper? Adfreeshows.com has literally tens of thousands of hours worth of bonus content, including fantastically popular series like Eric Fires Back, Idle Chase, and Strictly Business. And I don't know why this is a thing, but there's even more than 40 Ask Conrad episodes waiting for you at adfreeshows.com. We've got monthly Zoom chats with all the podcast hosts, live watch-alongs with wrestling legends, and more. Come on now. See for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans have already discovered. That's adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling today. Check it out right now, adfreeshows.com. You'll be glad you did. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good. I'm in Oklahoma for a rare occasion, so uh, I'm good. It's nothing like you and I were talking before we went on, we started recording. There's nothing like being home. I love Florida. I'm glad I bought a place there. Uh, I enjoy staying there when the opportunity presents itself, which is most times, seems like. But there's nothing like home, and Oklahoma's home, period, in the story. Case closed, Ernie. Well, I'm glad to see you back in Oklahoma. And I have a feeling that you're going to try to be there more often than not during football season. I can't believe it. Uh, next weekend, or as we're talking this weekend, uh, folks are going to be gearing up for football. And I know you and I are fired up because we're going to have wrestling and football on our mind this weekend. We got our big (laughs) annual top guy weekend get together. Uh, so some of our family members who were a big part of what we're doing behind the paywall over on Patreon. They're going to get, uh, the show of, of a lifetime this weekend. And then you guys are going to try to steal the show on Sunday. You got a big week in Chicago. Oh. Of course, last night D- dynamite this Friday, tomorrow night rampage. And then the big pay-per-view on Sunday, buddy, everybody and their brother is talking about AEW, and, uh, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs in Chicago. Are there not? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, based on what we've seen thus far, it's hard to predict what is going to come out of the mind of Tony Khan. Yeah. Uh, and I say that in a very pleasant in a positive way, because as a broadcaster, when things get too predictable, it's not fun. Yeah. So, uh, and I will say I'm having a blast because I love trying to keep up with him and, uh, it's very challenging to do because there are so many right ways to address these storylines. Uh, you know, if you have your favorite, you know, you're a moxie guy, you're a punk guy, whatever the case may be, uh, that's cool. And that's your prerogative, but man, oh man, it's just, uh, it's hard to keep up with, with what's going on. And, uh, it makes you think, and you hit the key thing, you know, everybody's talking. Yes. That's a good thing. Everybody's talking. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know the event, as far as I know, anyway, is sold out on Sunday night. Uh, there are some tickets left for Friday and, uh, as best I know. Uh, so, you know, it'll, it'll, it's going to be fun. It's going to be unpredictable. And I can promise you that, uh, if there's a, if anybody knows for sure, what's going to happen, they're keeping it to themselves, which I think is beautiful. Yeah. It's going to, it's what makes wrestling fun. You know, when, when we can't call it, uh, Eric always brags about Sarsa and the first letter of that, uh, the S stands for surprise. And I think a lot of people were surprised with what they saw last Wednesday and yeah, I, have I was, a, I have a feeling that there's going to be, uh, some more fun surprises in, in our future. So you, you got to, yes, you started a trend. Now you started, you're on this journey and the road that we're traveling right now is full of surprises and twists and turns and unpredictability. So if you start that way, you, you, one would assume that you got to finish your journey. You gotta, you gotta finish. And, uh, 
uh, and finish in the style that, that you just, you've established. So it should be a hell of a weekend. I'm looking forward to it. I'll get a, you know, I hit my, uh, I'll go, I always go to more uh, Morton's, uh, Gibson's Gibson's steakhouse. And I guess because of where we're staying this time out, my Gibson's trip will be to, uh, uh, the, the Rosemont Gibson's, uh, instead of going all the way back downtown. So, but I will get a meal in at Gibson's. That's my spot. And I don't know if this, as much as the food is phenomenal and they can do a great, uh, charred medium steak, perfect. Uh, or, uh, I just am superstitious. I don't know. Maybe a little both. Well, I'll tell you what, you and I are going to have a lot to be thankful for that weekend. Not only we get to uh, fellowship with, uh, all the folks who were subscribers to adfreeshows.com. But with some of our wrestling pals as well, and we're coming together for a great cause. I want to give a, a big plug right now for something we're doing. It's like a podcast super show that you can take a look at on fight. And we're donating 100% of the proceeds to Mongo. Now, to be clear, the show is free on fight. I encourage you to go check it out on fight, but then we want you to go to moneyformongo.com. At moneyformongo.com, you'll see it's a donation page. 100% goes directly to Mongo. There's no haircut off the top for production or whatever. We're, we're, <laughs> yeah. Everybody's working together here to raise money for Mongo. He's really in the fight of his life. And we've yes, got legit, legit. We have got an all-star lineup. We've got Tony Schiavone. We've got Jim Ross. We've got Eric Bischoff. We've got Jeff Jarrett. We've got the nature boy himself, Rick Flair. And we've got Mick Foley. All trying to make you laugh, trying to entertain you, trying to tell some fun stories, but most importantly, trying to raise some money for Mongo. And we would encourage you to go to moneyformongo.com, make your donation. And, uh, of course, tune in on fight. Can't wait to see, uh, what, what, what our turnout is going to be and how much money we can raise for Mongo. And it's just a great cause in a great town for a great man. Yep. Yeah. He's a big part of the fabric of, uh, the last couple of three generations of Chicago ones. Uh, you know, Chicago bears and this legendary figure there, local broadcaster has run at WCW. Uh, he's a, uh, he's a hell of a guy. Flair and I talked to him on the phone, uh, several months ago, Rick was in Jacksonville. And, uh, so we met at the, uh, at the bar, believe it or not. And nature and I did had a little, had a little, uh, snapple and, uh, we talked to him on the phone and, and maybe I'll tell that story, uh, cause it's even, it's even too coarse for podcasting. He's a funny son of a bitch still has a sense of humor. Uh, he's still a man. And, uh, I think that, uh, that man deserves some help and all of us that have the ability to do so it's that simple. I mean, this is a, and all the money goes to Mongo. So like, I love the Conrad's expression. Nobody's getting a haircut off the top and they're not, nobody's making a quarter out of this deal except Mongo. And we need him to make a lot of money for this crazy medical costs. He said, well, he's in the, in the NFL. Well, talk to some NFL guys about their insurance policies. Yeah. You might get a different story. He's bad. So anyways, great cause Conrad. You had another great idea. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, participate and support in it. Check it out, boys and girls, money for mongo.com. He's in the fight of his life, uh, with ALS. And this is an unbelievable disease. That's just ravaged a really strong human being. And, uh, man, every little bit helps. So please consider donating it's money for mongo.com, but that's not why we're here today. We're here today to talk about what happened 30 years ago, the 20th clash of the champions. It's also the 20th anniversary of wrestling on TBS. And it's going to be an interesting time to say the least. Um, <laughs> that's a good, it, it, you said that with a twinkle in your eye. Well, because so because much, you know, going that, on. you know, that large parts of putting that damn show together was a shit show. Nonetheless, yes, it, it was for a great cause as we've talked causes It was a great celebration. And, uh, it was certainly memorable because it had all the players there that you wouldn't th- expect to be seen in a WCW event. All the other guys were there unexpectedly. And I thought that was kind of cool. It is cool to think about the 20th anniversary of wrestling on TBS. It's weird to know that it happened. This big celebration happened without Ric Flair, but WCW boy, things are a changing. And one of the things they're trying to do is, Hey, let's get these houses up. So they come up with a few different ideas. 
One of them is, Hey, uh, for each paying adult ticket, we'll give you two free kids tickets. The result is you're having 30 to 40% more people show up to your show, but you're not really making a whole lot more money. Um, but it looks bigger. It looks more encouraging and the houses are not huge. The largest ones were Jacksonville on August 15th for 37 grand Atlanta the next day for 35,000 little rock a couple of days later on the 19th for 32,000. But there's also down markets buildings in Louisiana and Arkansas are bringing around 20,000 and we're trying whatever we can to get some new eyeballs on the product. And one of them results in a pretty famous and memorable angle that I can't believe is, you know, 30 years ago, Ron Simmons becomes the WCW world champion. And we have the debut of Jake, the snake Roberts. So there's lots of moves that the Cowboys trying to make. And of course, in the background, he's having phenomenal matches. He being sting big van Vader. I mean, you've got great wrestling, but you're definitely trying some new things. Jake Roberts is obviously a a legacy WWF star, somebody that the the cowboy had a lot of experience with, and he's going to be in the main event spot. And so is Ron Simmons. And listen, a lot has been made about, you know, Bill Watts is this, or Bill Watts is that I just want to remind everybody. And again, I don't even know Mr. Watts. I never met him, but I just want to remind everybody and correct me if I'm wrong here, Mr. Ross. I think he had the first ever African-American booker in wrestling. I think you might be right. I think, I mean, his top draw was an African-American wrestler named junkyard dog as the baby face, the hero. Yes. The role model. Yes. An elevated position uh, in perception to the wrestling fans. And he was on a television show that was killing it in the ratings. People say, well, you guys weren't drawing. We weren't drawing because the economy was bad and we didn't have the attractions they wanted to see, which is normally the reason people don't draw houses and poor marketing. And I was involved in all those areas. So I'm just full disclosure here. I'm a big boy. I can, I can take my own, uh, scorn, but, uh, you know, Bill was, Bill was all about business and, and, uh, it made sense. Because our, our demographics, our geographical uh, makeup in Louisiana and Mississippi, and you got a black booker and a black champion, how hard is that to even figure out? Why wouldn't you do that? You know? So, but a lot of the white promoters, and I know firsthand, were very much against Cowboy doing that. They said it was going to ruin the business. So uh, that was some sadder days. I'm, I'm going to have a lot more to say about that type of thing in uh, my next book, which we're getting ready to start. We're having a big meeting on it on Monday. Uh, so, uh, it's done. We got a contract. We got a publisher. Uh, we're ready to rock and roll, but things like that. I want to kind of flush out a little bit because I think it's important for everybody to know. And then without me sounding like I'm, I'm, uh, you know, leading the parade for the cowboy, he don't need anybody to lead a parade for him, but, uh, everything is not always as it seems and nor always as it's written. I want to, uh, again, remind everybody as we're talking about Watts, not only did he do this with Ernie Ladd and, and, and with JYD, but now that he's got the big seat in WCW and he's got national television, he wants to make Ron Simmons, the first ever African-American world champion. That's a big dog on deal. And one that is obviously going to be up for debate and criticism because you know, was, was he the right guy at the time? It almost felt like a statement of sorts. Did you see that? Yeah. Okay. In a way. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think you make a good point there, Conrad, the, the, uh, the, the deal to me was when people were naysaying about Ron becoming the champion, is he the right guy? I think what they're really saying is, is it the right time for an African-American to be recognized as the world champion. That's what it all boils down to me because you you can't say he didn't have the athletic ability. He's a three-time all American football player at Florida state D one big time Heisman trophy ballot getter, a great athlete. Could he use more polish? Yes, but that comes through your booking and getting talented heels that can embellish uh, his Ron skill set. So I think that's, that became a racial thing without it. And it's just basically just being whispered. 
Cowboy believed that Ron was the guy and he believed it was time for it to happen. And it, 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 and it, it, I couldn't think of any reasons not to do it. Cause again, we can't use the reason. Well, he wasn't a good worker. That's not true. In my opinion. Right. It's not true. Right. So he, was it Rick Flair? Hell no. Right. Hey, look, you're not going to replace Flair. Get that. Who's going to replace Brady for God's sake. Right. Nobody, nobody. So, uh, uh, I think this thing is boils down to an ugly story of ugly whispers about race, which, uh, hopefully we're far past that in, in, in a lot of fronts. I think we are, we've made great strides, but there's still a long way to travel. The, uh, the newspapers in the mainstream, uh, including the ones that Mike Mooneyham wrote for had a lot to say about WCW quote, several WCW performers say morale has reached a new low. And they would go on to say that many of the talent on the WCW side are not very trusting of bill Watts quote. These guys have families. And one of the reasons they're here is to make guaranteed money. Terry Taylor has a family. He was making $3,000 a week. He's spending 30% of that on taxes and out of the rest, he's spending 75,000 a year on the road. He's not staying in suites with jacuzzis. That's 75,000 in business expenses to live on the road. And Watts takes him off contract. In the meantime, he can't take independent dates because he's afraid he'll have a WCW booking and have to cancel at the last minute, or he'll get fired for accepting independent dates. Watts is going to have to hope that the Slaters, the barbarians, the Williams and Gordy's will do the jobs because the sting Steiners, Terry Taylor's Rudes, and Austin's will not stay around under these conditions. Now, good point. The reference is Watts was trying to come in and right size the payroll. And that means we're going to put everybody on a nightly deal, which also means if you don't work, you don't get paid. And Meltzer would even know here, since this article was printed, Taylor was let go and not offered the $300 per night to work an unspecified schedule. So coming in for 300 bucks, when you've still got to pay your road expenses out of that, that's a tough else. Yes. Right. You got to change, you got to change employers. Yeah. It's, this is not working for you. It's not going to work for you. You, I don't, I, I, I never like that, that, th- that philosophy that we were, that we had, uh, where those guys got put on nightly. So you can't make a living. You can't make a living. And if you can't make a living, then why are you there? Look, do you have any other skill sets that you can market? Or is there another wrestling company that will hire you where you can make a living? One of the two things, right? You are going to stay in wrestling and make a living. If, hopefully. Because we know you love it, uh, or you're going to find something else to do for a living. Terry Taylor obviously likes to talk and Terry's always been vocal. Uh, but you know, he's got a job now where he can use his wrestling skills as a coach, as a teacher worked out fine. So I don't know. I, I, I didn't like that. The plan was a plan that was created seemingly to fail. The bottom line for cowboy was the bottom line. And that was his strict focus, his strict mandate, his orders from headquarters from Ted himself is you got to cut costs. Well, so you look, you start looking at your line items and where you can cut Conrad, you know, I'm sure you do this to some degree every day. You evaluate your business. Yeah. Something pops up. Oh yeah. I need to, I want to, I'm going to fix that. That's costing us money. That doesn't need to happen type thing. Yes. All businessmen are that way. So I, I think that, uh, I think that it was a plan. It was a, it was a structure that was built to fail and it did in that regard. You cannot allow somebody to, they can't buy their, they can't pay their rent or they can't buy their groceries. They can't buy their, their kid, a new pair of tennis shoes. I mean, come on. It's just a lack, lack of common sense. Nobody said anything in a Mike Mooney. And I like Mike, Mike's a nice guy. I've known Mike forever, but nothing he said, he said nothing, Conrad, that you and I wouldn't. Talk about one of the first things in, in a, in a business class, you, you can't pay your bills and you're making less than you're spending. You're in trouble. Watts apparently gets wind of this article and he is not happy. So before there's a TV taping at the Omni, he, uh, has a meeting and this is the report from the observer. Watts asked if anyone had a problem and then told them he wanted to know if anyone had a morale problem. 
Surprisingly, one wrestler, Nikita Koloff spoke up and talked about having a problem with the rule about having to stay in the buildings until the main event ends every night and missing occasional chances to catch a late flight home and spend an extra night every now and then with his family, which because of his travel schedule, family time is limited. Right. Watts responded. And since I've only heard this from one source and don't want to misquote, but suffice to say every wrestler with a family, which is most of the guys were left cold with something along the lines of this business isn't conducive for family life. And Mick Foley wrote something similar in his book. And I know that, you know, this is old school and all that sort of stuff, but mm. is this the right approach? If you do think there's a morale problem, it does no. feel a little heavy handed. It is, is heavy handed. It's a double chop uh-uh, to the sternum. The giant Korean Pak Song Nam with incredible force has the American dream bleeding. His face is a crimson mask. Uh, no, it's not the way you handle it. Did it work? No. So it wasn't a way to handle it. Right. You know, I don't think you, you and I, you, you probably have one, uh, a business degree. I ain't, I got a wrestling degree and I don't know how good, <laughs> and I don't know if I'm bitching or, or, or bragging or complaining. Uh, but no, it's not the way you handle it. Of course not. And, but that's the way it was chosen to be handled by the head of the department. You're in a corporate world. It is a different ball game than other worlds. Trust me on that. Corporate wrestling is daunting because you have so many people involved in the decision-making that don't have a lot of product knowledge. Well, that's a pretty color on her. You know, who's that man with a tennis racket? <laughs> God damn it, Conrad. Take me off your show. Uh, so, no, it's not the way you handle it, but. That's the way it was attempted to be handled. Of course, uh, Watts is trying to right size the payroll. The observer had a lot to say about that quote. The new deals go something like this. Keep in mind. These are figures and stipulations. I was told specifically. However, I have also not seen a contract myself, so I can't guarantee authenticity of every word of this, but I'm pretty sure it's close. If not the complete story, main eventers are going to earn a thousand dollars a show. Middle of the card guys earn 500 bucks and the preliminary guys, three fifty. There would be no guarantee for the number of dates you'd be booked with a full schedule at a thousand dollars a show. That's hardly anything to cry about, but if the wind blows strangely and a new booker is put in charge and you're not in his plans and everyone in that company has seen firsthand how that story goes, you simply can be erased from shows and make no money, but still be under contract. So listen, business is down across the board. In 92. It's not a WCW problem. It's a wrestling problem. And there's a saying that wrestling is cyclical. But nobody has ever seen an about face like this for so long. WCW was deemed as the place to be because you got guaranteed money. Now you might become a bigger star for Vince McMahon. Uh, that's almost a guarantee, True. but there is no guaranteed money and he's going to give you opportunity. Well, what's being old school sees, Hey man, the only way to make this thing profitable, we got to cut expenses where we can. And maybe we should start paying the guys on the houses or the way, I don't know. Wrestling's always been done. He doesn't like this guaranteed idea, but that's now a major issue for the talent because they feel like they're going to have to make some choices. Yep. Is, is this the biggest upheaval in a locker room you had ever seen? Oh gosh. I don't know. There's a, there's weekly upheavals. There's upheavals. And there was, there were having upheavals in 74 when I first walked into my first locker room, Conrad. Uh, I haven't been in the locker room yet in my buku years of wrestling that didn't have up, up, uproars and have issues, but you can't get that many high testosterone loaded alpha male insecure, uh, guys in a confined area on a regular basis and not have issues. It's just human nature. It's going to happen and things have to be put into place so that that, uh, you can help, hopefully avoid some of those issues. The main thing that has to be put in place is communication and Cowboy's deal was my way or the highway. He's still that old tough guy, you know, ex shooter, uh, booker top baby face and all that. You got to remember he's a, he's an extraordinary guy. He was headlining main events in the garden in his third year in the business. 
Name me somebody else that you can think of right now, other than maybe Brock Lesnar that did that. Maybe Brock. It's a small little group, Conrad. Yeah. yeah. He's a he's a different breed of cat. He's still very competitive. And I don't I thought I think he's probably believed that any sort of compromise would, would be a sign of weakness. And that was not going to be his play. Well, I'll tell you what, there's uh there's no weakness in, in getting a good night's sleep. You and I are both chilly sleep believers. I've got one. I travel with it. I absolutely love it. Actually, I have more than one. I travel with one though. <laughs> It, it's, it's like a freaking smart thermostat. And you, and look, and you ain't got to be rich to travel with one. No, because these are affordable folks. <laughs> and this solves a lot of issues. And you know, if you ever wonder why Conrad and I have so many sponsors that, uh, uh, that are involved in sleep in some shape, form or fashion, we're both not just reading a copy. You know, I don't have any copy, right? Uh, I, I, I believe that this is a great product. Because it works. It's that simple. Let's don't overthink this shit. So, uh, it, and, and we, and the proof is there. You got two guys that I hope you can trust that's telling you the truth and this product works and you can save some money on it right here. It absolutely does. It's like a, a smart thermostat for your bed. It keeps your bed at the ideal temperature. Chili sleep is designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep and give you the power and energy you need to just dominate your day the next day. And that's what I've seen. Uh, first of all, I'm sleeping better than ever. I'm not tossing. I'm not turning. I'm not fighting with the pillows or covers. I have the right temperature. So I'm not trying to get comfortable. I'm comfortable right away. And I know I'm getting good quality sweet because I'm dreaming bright, vivid, yep. colorful dreams. And, and, and guys, I'm colorblind, but I'm not in my dreams. I mean, this is fantastic. I can't recommend this enough. <laughs> I feel better than ever. And what's cool is, you know, I have one on my bed and Megan wants to sleep a little warmer than I do. So my side's colder than her side. We both have our ideal temperature on our side of the bed. Imagine waking up and not feeling tired. That's our life right now. Whether you want to sleep hot or cold, they're going to, they're going to check all the boxes for you. Head over right now. A friend of mine says it costs nothing to look nothing. Head over to chillysleep.com forward slash Jr. To learn more and save 30% off the purchase of any new there. cube or Uller sleep system. 30%. He didn't stutter. No, I did not. And this offer is available exclusively for grilling JR listeners only for a limited time. I've got the cube. Uh, you, you, you want to, I've got the Uller, but the cube sleep system's just as good. Check it out. That's chili C H I L I sleep.com slash JR to take advantage of our exclusive discount. Wake up feeling refreshed every day. Sincerely, it's changed my life. Chillysleep.com forward slash JR. Let's jump back in and talk about Bill Watts a little more because he's got other things on his mind besides just cutting the budget. He wants to bring in some new talent. He's going to bring in Chris Benoit. He's going to bring in Shane Douglas. And all of a sudden, Eric Watts' name starts popping up on the booking sheets. And that's probably going to be something that he gets judged about. Both guys, as a matter of fact. It can't be easy to come in as the boss's son when the boss has all this controversy surrounding it's him a, about pay cuts and all that. It's a no win for everybody. No win. You can look at all the characters in this uh, soap opera, uh, and all of them had great value in certain ways, but in the roles they were thrust in, just wasn't clicking. And I felt bad for Eric because Eric really he wanted to be a. Uh, following the old man's footsteps, like something like the Von Erics, you know, there's a lot of role models. And sometimes you look at these role models and, uh, although I love Kevin Von Eric and his idyllic life in Hawaii, uh, and he's got two great sons that are pretty good hands, Ross and Marshall, good boys. And they're good boys. Uh, sometimes your role models aren't exactly ideal. And, uh, I thought Eric got a, kind of got a bad break. He wasn't ready for showtime. He wasn't ready for prime time. He wasn't ready for TVS television. And, and don't think that that wasn't spoken of in private meetings. I said it to Bill a zillion times. Love the kid. He's like a little nephew, but he ain't ready yet. He wasn't ready to play quarterback for Louisville until I met Howard Schnellenberger on an airplane. So it was, that's another good story. So we're down the road, but in any event, uh, he, he, he just wasn't ready. It was never going to work. If it had any chance of working, it would have been of the entitled rich kid 
heal. And that's a big, maybe as a baby face, no way in hell. Let's talk a little bit about Masa Chono. He's the NWO, uh, NWA champion. Yeah. Uh, and he's going to be coming in for Halloween havoc in Philadelphia to take on Rick rude. Why do you think, or what value do you think bill saw in the NWA title being a part of the program? Maybe a future relationship with the Japanese. You just mentioned he's looking for new talent and uh, you know, doc and Gordy are a great example. I love that team. Uh, and I missed both guys Boy, they were good. They're so good. Uh, and I dreamed of these matches with them and Steiners and things like that. Just, and, and I know the fans would have, that would have got over. I just can't not believe it would not get over the thing about the Japanese guys coming in. They were great entering hands technicians. We didn't have them for long enough periods of time, nor did we take the extra effort to make vignettes so the audience could be introduced to them and they could develop a personality because the promo ability for most of them was almost non-existent. So you had to do other things to tell me who they are and why I should give a shit. We didn't do a good job of that at all. A couple other fellows are out JYD, unbelievably longtime bill guy, no longer with the company and Curtis Hughes is out too. And Meltzer would report that Curtis is out due to some legal problems. Do you remember hearing about this? The only thing negative I've ever, I can recall hearing about Curtis was the fact that poor bastard had a, I don't know if it was sleep apnea, but he'd fall asleep sitting in the airport. Yeah. He was, and, he was like narcoleptic, right? Yeah. That word. Yeah. I can't spell it, but I can say it now that you did, I think. Uh, but yeah, Curtis is never, never a problem yeah. that I can recall. Uh, and I, I got, I think the world of Curtis, he's a good guy and he's proven that he's trained a lot of real good talents in his school there in Atlanta. So, uh, dog, dog just got lazy dog spent too many trips at the, at the, uh, at the little candy bar place in the, in the hotels. Yeah. He just got lazy and he wasn't motivated. He didn't have any money. He didn't see the end. He didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It was sad. Because he had a lot of money at one time and unfortunately he blew it. So, uh, yeah, if cowboy is to part ways a dog, one would think it would be hard for bill to make that decision. It wasn't. Here's something that blew me away and it blew Meltzer away at the time. He wrote this. Want to hear a statistic that will blow your mind in July. The weekly WCW show in England averaged 3.7 million viewers per week. By contrast, the Saturday night TBS show is at best getting 2 million viewers in this country. So nearly double over there. But not only that, the two WWF shows only average 308,000 viewers. So that means WCW has a 12 to one edge in viewership here in the UK. Now, of course, this is because of the channel it's on, but still my goodness, what an edge you guys had across the pond. It didn't take advantage of it. How many trips do we make over there? How many promotions do we build around major themed events in the, in the, the UK? Right. I don't remember, I don't remember very many. Um, Bruno San Martino is being discussed in the observer. He's been talked about as being the Northeastern representative and many think he'll come in with some kind of role. Were you high on that? Did you see the value in having him as a legend to help you know, draw something for the lot local live events or something. Did, was there still value in Bruno San Martino for WCW? In some, yeah. In some markets, in some markets, at the, in Vince's old territory, of course, uh, done right classy, but not, to, not to shoot an angle or get him involved in physicality and things of that nature. I think what Bruno could do, it was basically the same theory I had with Sean Michaels. We get Sean Michaels back in the fold was you can help me in the locker room. You can help these kids learn to be better. You can help these kids learn to pick up some of your techniques and some of your timing and some of your, some of your specific things that make you good from a physical standpoint. I think Bruno, it would be, would have been a great coach or teacher mentor, uh, a lot of things like that. But with Bruno came credibility with Bruno. A lot of the old sports people were still Bruno guys. So there, there, there would be some advantages to it. But as far as shooting angles to sell tickets for live events, I don't think so much. Let's talk a little bit about the other thing about booking Bruno. I'm just curious. 
you know, was it business or, I mean, part of it has to be, boy, this will really fucking piss off Vince. If we can get Bruno, well, I mean, I, I guess it's probably something in there. I don't know what percentage or what number, right. Based on one out of 10 thing. I'm sure it had a play in it, but I don't think it was the deciding play in it. The, the bill, bill got his break, big time break in pro wrestling from Bruno. Bruno saw cowboy lifting weights at a gym in New York. And he, he, all of a sudden Bruno and cowboy were tag team partners. And they had a nice run as tag team partners. And then of course, inevitably the tag team partners break up. Bruno's still the baby face, of course. And Cowboys, the big loud mouth, Oki, uh, talking about his ranch and all this other stuff. Uh, and they had three matches. They had three single matches in the garden, which was, at that time had never been done to my knowledge. Right. So, uh, so Bruno helped get bill over. And when all these other promoters, the Ganyas of the world and, and raced, uh, um, our boy Shire and Fritz and all these other cats, uh, guys in Atlanta, Eddie Graham, when they heard about this young kid that's six, three, 300 pounds, uh, selling out with Bruno in his third year in the business, they were interested. So Bill owed Bruno to some degree, no doubt. And I think that's good. He tried to pay the, repay the debt. But I always thought that Bruno would have been more of a figurehead. Maybe he'd lay down some rulings or something like that, but not as a talent, not an entering talent. I don't think it would have been safe to do it. Uh, and I don't think it would have been a smart move. So Magnum TA is, is going to be removed from power hour. He's going to be replaced by Larry Zabisco and Magnum's new role is with the title of director of player personnel. This sounds like he was sort of your maybe one of your heads of talent relations at the time, even though we weren't probably calling it that. Do you remember yeah. uh, Magnum doing a good job in that? Well, yeah, he did. Uh, he, he was, uh, he paid attention and he had been a talent, uh, still a ta in spirit. He's still a talent. Uh, so we all, we knew his heart would always be in the right place and it was, uh, but he took over a tough job, you know, r wrestling. It's funny. No matter what your structure may be on a, piece of paper or on a chalkboard or it was dry race jobs The in wrestling, the talents want to talk to the, t the head guy. They want to talk. So in this case, it would have been, they would talk to Terry, but they want to get their answer from cowboy. And it's all, and that, that hamstrings a guy like Magnum, right? Hands it hamstrung a guy like me. At the end of the day, that's what they wanted to do. They want to talk to the same deal with Vince. I had, to, that was a, that was a lot of work to get that line. That was always outside Vince's door at TV eliminated and go away, vanish, uh, because it, it gave him time to, to get involved in more things, which is, I think part of my gig. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know exactly. I'm, I'm wandering on you today, Conrad, but, uh, I'm looking at the beautiful sky here. It's cloudy in Oklahoma. It's only about 85. I'd almost go outside and lay by the pool, but I might scare children. Uh, it's, your, it's, it's your pool. You should, you should do it. <laughs> hey, so on August 31st, uh, the company airs the, the famous Wembley stadium, SummerSlam show, uh, what a huge success it was. And I'm curious what you thought of that. I mean, you know, that WCW is trying to level up where they can, and we're trying to get expenses in line and we're trying to grow and we're doing Hey, buy one adult ticket. We'll give you two kids free. But then you see the WWF put together such a huge crowd and such a monumental event. And you know, we've got four times the viewers or 12 times the viewers they do. Like, is that motivating or does it work as a demotivator when you see such a huge success like that? Well, it's a, it's a demotivator if you're WCW, because you see missed opportunity and right. missed opportunity. And the, the heartbeat of any wrestling promotion is for television show in a story. And we didn't take advantage of that. And, it's, and, and we had the data. It wasn't a guess. I think we're doing pretty good there. Right. And we got the numbers. So yeah, it was kind of de demoralizing because we were leaving the money on the ground. And it seemed like that was the whole thrust of cowboy coming in to start with is to shake the, the, the limbs and shake some of that money out and save some and all that good stuff. So. Uh, but make no mistake about it, Conrad, the, the he Calvo was never told you got to get new talent. 
they didn't have the product knowledge to tell him that the upper, the upper the bill Shaw's of the world and so forth, but they can sure as hell tell you uh, how to navigate the bottom line. And we want this bottom line lessened considerably by X date. So that's where cowboy got his, that's where his marching orders came from. Timing wise, you guys are doing the class just two days after the big stadium show. Um, I just, I don't think one had anything to do with the other. No, not at all. Uh, -uh. Uh, here we are. Let's talk about clash 20 Meltzer were the readers of the observer only gave it 61 and a half percent thumbs up, but on paper, it looked to be pretty decent. Meltzer would say this clash 20 took place on September 2nd at center stage in Atlanta, part reminiscing and old time lapse features part wrestling card as the former. It was a very enjoyable show. I'd give the show a strong thumbs up because I enjoyed the old features as a wrestling card. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't good. Eight matches turned into five, but the show was better off that way. And at least it was free. Quite frankly, I couldn't wait for the matches to end to see more old footage. None of the bouts were bad, but the wrestling aspect was nothing special. So uh, we're, we're serving two masters here. On the one hand, we're, we're celebrating a big anniversary. And on the other hand, we're trying to show you our current product. And I'm sure in times like this, especially just reading that recap from Dave, it does make you wonder, man, are we doing ourselves a disservice by showing the audience how great our product used to be and then carting <laughs> out the current stuff? What say you? Uh, I think that you have to show what it used to be because that's a part of the 20 year history of wrestling on TBS. That's part of the theme of the, that was the theme of the, the event. Hence bringing in Andre and bringing in, uh, Bruno, for example, among others, among many others, Gordon, they brought Gordon back. I thought that was wonderful. So, uh, I think you got to show to, to try to navigate where you're going. You need to know where you've been. So I think that, uh, at least that's my take on it. So I, I think that, yeah, you got to show them that, but what you got to do is you got to make sure that your in-ring product on that night is extra is e- extraordinary or it's exceptional. It's really solid. You got guys there that like to work with each other. They have good chemistry. You got to make sure that happens. And I think that's where we drop the ball. Everybody is focused so much on the other elements of that broadcast, uh, that we almost, we, well, I guess we could say neglected to ensure that the wrestling product was going to be really good. Uh, the decision to have this in Atlanta, I guess makes sense. Uh, we're probably not in a spot where we could go sell out the Omni, but center stage, I mean, it seats under a thousand. Um, and it is significant for the promotion, but what do you think of, does this almost feel like conceding defeat when it is, this is the 20th clash of the champions and we're running a tiny building or did it make sense to you? I looked at it as a TV studio. Yes. Not an arena event. We weren't ready for arena events of that magnitude. Like, so if you're going to run the Omni, you want the Omni to be full. Right. And there's not many ways to guarantee that, uh, as, as soft as our product was, and as, as, you know, benign. Uh, so I think I look at it more as a TV studio. It, it's like going on the road now, you know, we're, we're in Chicago all week. Uh, for AEW and every building, the buildings, all, all, it becomes a TV studio. That's what it is. And so and now we're fortunate that we've sold a lot of tickets, which is great. The atmosphere atmosphere at our live shows is, is the most dynamic that I've ever experienced in my career with the exception of a few mid South shows in a, in the Superdome type things, downtown municipal auditorium, that type deal. Some shows in the attitude era, obviously. And, uh, but right now, you know, we have the craziest, most rabid fan base, I think is in pro wrestling. That's just my take on it. I'm not knocking anybody by saying that. Oh, he's taking shots at WWE again. God almighty Conrad. What's happened to civilization for God's sakes. Right. He's taking shots. Okay. I'm not, but what if I am? What if I am, does it matter? Is my voice that loud to be heard by that many people? That's going to make a difference. No, I don't think so. I'm a wrestling fan. who has an opinion. Who's fortunate enough to work with a great guy on this podcast with a hell of a crew and all you guys, I don't look at this thing too. I don't get too crazy about this deal. 
I'm, I'm blessed to have it. I'm blessed to be able to look at my you, Conrad. There's a funny deal that that red Oklahoma calf says beat, beat Nebraska. We played them this year at Lincoln. I think I'm going to go. It's autographed by Barry Switcher. You think I should wear that cap to the game or my hat? <laughs> anyway, let's talk a little bit about Bob Dew and Bill Shaw. At the start of the show, we see these guys arriving, and I understand they're higher ups within the Turner organization, but does anybody at home need to know that or give a mm-hmm. shit that they're there? What do you think of that? Oh, it's just their way to get their ass on television. Yeah. TV cameo. So they can tell their buddies, you know, to, at the golf course or down in Augusta or where they play golf. I don't know. This is getting on TV. That's all it was. Cowboys working them a little bit and he was working cowboy. They were working cowboy a little bit, but the bottom line was the magic was them being on TV. Simple as that. I want to mention, uh, the first match, man, it's a big one. Ricky steamboat is going to pin Steve Austin to win the TV title. They go nearly 11 minutes. Paulie dangerously, of course, is with Steve Austin and they're going to have him in a shark cage above the ring. And Meltzer would say largely to keep him off of television, which made me laugh. Uh, Steamboat was wearing rib protection, but Austin ripped it off him midway through. They did a double tombstone reversal and went to near falls. And the finish came when Austin threw Steamboat out of the ring. Steamboat crawled under the ring and came out the other side and came off the top. Again, this is an ODQ match with a flying cross body for the pin. Meltzer would say all solid work, but the match came off a little flat on TV because of the lack of crowd reaction. Three and a quarter stars. So a lot to unpack there. You got two of the greatest that ever did it. Yep. Uh, and, and arguably the greatest or one of the greatest, you know, managers involved in the equation as well. Correct. But when you've got a small building like this, you hope they're at least lively, like they would yep. be at say the ECW arena or what have you. And they weren't. What do you do when you, man, we got good wrestlers. We got good talent. We got a good match. And they that's the they, start of the show. I think they came to see the pageantry. More in the, in the, 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 the nice little accoutrements than they did to see the wrestling. Our wrestling wasn't selling any tickets. The wrestling was losing money. So why would we be foolish enough to think that, oh, our, well, on this one night, this given night, they'll, they'll come alive again. If you're not going to give a shit about Austin and Steamboat, I don't know what you do. I mean, obviously, that's not, that wasn't it. But so what is? I don't know the answer to that question. What was the relationship like with Bill Watts and Paul Heyman? Uh, adversarial, uh, cowboy had a lot of respect for Paul's intellect and, and cowboy knew that Paul was going to eventually become a great manager. And he has, uh, but they were a little adversarial, uh, just personalities, strong personalities. And I don't know, I was never in any meetings, private meetings that I don't, that I can recall. I might've been with Bill and Paul. So I don't know exactly how Paul conducted himself in the meetings, the meeting he might have a cowboy. And that's the key. It's like, I used to tell talents about Vince. You don't confront Vince. You, you converse, converse, not confront. Well, you just want to kiss his ass. Okay. That's what your thoughts are. They're going to lose this argument anyway. So, uh, yeah, converse better deal. So they, they, they were a little adversarial Conrad, but I think they both had great respect at, at varying aspects of the other's game, but they both had coarse ways to communicate at times. So we're obviously ready for Austin to get to the next level. And you can see that it's time for him to move up here. This is a great match. Did you think? Watts had big plans for Austin as a single. I think so. Yeah. He liked his work ethic, his toughness, his look, his passion, all the, he checked all the boxes. And uh, so I think so. I, I, there was nothing to not like about Steve. He had, uh, you know, he had seven years experience of whatever it was when he got there, he wasn't green. Uh, and he was hungry as hell and great motivation. So I think cowboy, uh, saw the potential in Steve Austin who, and quite frankly, how could you not? Right. So talk to me a little bit about, uh, Bruno and your relationship. I asked because during the match, Jesse Ventura cuts a Bruno San Martino joke. You completely ignore it and move on. 
All right. Did, did, as far as you know, Jesse have some sort of, uh, long-standing issue with Bruno or is he you just, know, he might have Conrad he yeah. could have, I, I'm not sure what all went on back in the, those old WWWF days. Uh, they're around each other a lot, you know, uh, they're different philosophies. Bruno is more old school and Jesse is more tie dye and, you know, sunglasses and things, you know, more hip. Sure. Uh, so the philosoph- philosoph- philosophies probably weren't too much aligned. I can't say I either wouldn't respect the other for right. accomplishments, quite frankly. So, uh, but I, I just didn't, I don't really remember exactly even the joke, but apparently I thought it was weak enough to ignore. Didn't let's, need it. let's, uh, let's talk about the, the tag package because next up we get to look back at the various tag teams over the years. They're going to be sure to feature the road warriors who were just on the other show, the free birds, the rock and roll express, the Briscoes, the Briscoes in particular, I don't know. I found that interesting just knowing their, their backstory, but they were a big part of this. And mm. that just plays into the theme. The next match kind of does too. It's Arn Anderson and Bobby Eaton. I mean, can you imagine if they really had a long pairing together as a tag team? Like those are the two maybe greatest tag team wrestlers of all time together. Yeah. And they're going to take on Valentine and Slater. Uh, Zabisco is in Slater and Valentine's corner for what Meltzer called inexplicable reasons. And he goes to hit Anderson with his cast. Anderson moves and he hits Valentine Eaton and pins Valentine with the Alabama jam off the middle rope. And Meltzer would say the cameras miss, uh, Larry Zabisco's interference originally and replay missed part of the finish as well. Half a star. When this happens where there's camera shots missed like this mm-hmm. is is the heat on the guys in the truck? Yeah. The, the agent, the talent. Yeah. In what order? If, if that makes sense. Well, the, the agent's got to tell the truck what the truck needs to see. Yes. So if the agent didn't communicate that well enough, then the onus goes on the agent. So it starts with the agent in my opinion, but the truck's got to translate what they were told by generally an ex wrestler. Who's trying to be a producer today. So, uh, that could be challenging. So, but yeah, it's, you've got to, it starts with the agent and it goes down to the, to the truck. They all got to be on the same page. They got to communicate. And oftentimes you get information late. Uh, you don't have time to prepare, uh, you know, and everybody's got their way of doing things and we should be doing this. We should be doing that. So it was, uh, it was, it was tough, but it, it ruined the match. You missed the biggest, the two biggest things in a match you blew. Yeah. And there's no way and you're, and you're working without a net, i.e. live television. So I kind of get why Larry's here in terms of, you know, he's kicked out of the dangerous Alliance. So there's an issue with him and Arn and, and Bobby. I get that, but it feels like there's almost no storyline for him to be here with Slater and Valentine. Maybe that's enough. Um, Michael yeah, Hayes, vet, go ahead. Two veterans, two veterans. You know, they've both, they've been around each other a long time. It's a weak story. It's a weak story, not a W E E K. It might be, it might last a week, but it was, it was just a uh, week. So as my granny would say, weaker than cat piss. Cat piss. Okay. That's a new it's one weak. for me. It's weak. Michael Hayes comes out with Arn and Bobby Eaton. Um, that could have been fun. Uh, What's, what's going on with Michael here? He's only like 33 years old, but it does feel like we're starting to transition him away from the in-ring stuff. Is it injuries or did he have some sort of aspirations of, or did he realize, Hey, this is my way to have some longevity in this game is to get out of the ring and work behind the scenes. Now, who are we referring to Michael Hayes? That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, Michael was always known as the third best worker of the three free birds in ring worker. Now putting behind a microphone, he's, he's, un, he's almost untouchable. Uh, and in one era, he might've been untouchable. So I think that, uh, you know, cowboy always had that philosophy about Michael. If you got buddy Rogers, uh, buddy Roberts, excuse me, or buddy Rogers, but if you have buddy Roberts and Terry Gordy, specifically Terry Gordy in the match, you're going to be okay. And, uh, and so Michael kind of parlayed off that. 
but it was well known that Michael's long-term future in pro wrestling would be as an administrator in some way. And the problem with that is always going to be, can you, as a former talent, separate yourself as a wrestler and become that full-time administrator and be objective and not have an agenda. That was always going to be the issue with Michael or anybody else's in this position. So I think that, uh, him moving up the ladder where he is today, uh, certainly has been a journey he's been on for a long, long time. Woo Wings, a virtual restaurant concept from the man himself, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with your Uber Eats or Postmates app. Woo Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa in Alabama, with many more locations coming soon. Try the only chicken wings worthy of carrying the name of the 16-time world heavyweight weight champion tell him nature wings legendary flavors world championship wings woo woo wings yeah woo woo but i feel strongly that saving money is important you know if it's not something we worry about now boy we are really going to worry about it later and i want to help you get out of debt faster and do it with cheaper monthly payments i'm talking to you if you're in a 30 year loan now is the time to take years off of your loan. We're routinely helping our listeners cut 5, 10, even 15 years off their loan. And you can do this without perfect credit, with no money out of pocket. You've just got to start at SaveWithConrad.com. After the match, Bill Watts comes out and strips Brad Armstrong of the light heavyweight title due to an injury. And he announces there's going to be a tournament for the vacant title. Uh, that tournament never takes place and the belt is instead retired. Chat me up about what, I mean, did Bill see any value in the light heavyweight division or did he not get it? It doesn't feel like it would have been something he would have been into. Cowboys, the big, the guy that said, uh, athletic, big men draw money. Yes. And he believed that because guess he looked in the mirror. He was an athletic, big man at one time. And he believed in that philosophy. So, uh, I don't know that he ever went on. He had a little rivalry with Hodge back in the old territory days where Hodge is getting a lot of the, uh, uh, pops and, and, the you know, the middle of fan support. Uh, and even though Cowboy had bought into the territory and own half of it, and was trying to push himself and bigger talent, bringing in big heels for Cowboy to work with. And that moved Hodge down the card. That was a little bit of a rub. Uh, but I don't know that I would say this. You could hire those cruiserweight guys fairly reasonably. And if they're going to draw money, then that's a good investment. Apparently cowboy thought that there was no money in the, in the cruiserweights. Yeah. Whether he was right or wrong is irrelevant. That was his decision. And quite, quite frankly, a guy like Brad Armstrong, Brad was big enough. He didn't need to be a cruiserweight anyway, in my opinion. Right. Well, Brian Pillman comes out he's going to turn heel on Armstrong, call him a coward, slap him. And now the road to the Hollywood blondes, I guess, begins here. Pillman as a heel, it's always been said it's, it's tough for a smaller man to be a heel, especially in this time frame. Um, you wanted, or at least the WWF wanted big bullies. what do you think of, of Pillman as a heel? We had seen him do fantastic work as a baby face with, mm-hmm. with the Bengal tiger prints and all that stuff, but. As a heel, I thought he did a fantastic job. What'd you think? I liked him as the heel because it was extension of his natural personality. And we've talked about that, uh, m- many times in the show about the best talents normally, uh, are derived from their own basic natural personality. And Brian was a undersized underdog. Always thought he was dealt a bad hand. He had all those surgeries, 30 something surgeries while he was just a little kid. Uh, he had a rough go. And he had a chip on his shoulder. And I think chips are most are best manifest as heels as a rule. And I think that's why I worked with Brian. I thought Brian was a much better heel than a baby face as a baby face. He came off a little disingenuous as a heel. He came off more natural and more organic. And I think that's where the wind came there for Brian. Next up, we got a video package of single stars from the past. You got Dusty Rhodes, Stan Hansen, Ron Garvin, Tony Atlas, Magnum TA, Buzz Sawyer, Mr. Wrestling two, 
the great Kabuki, Ted DiBiase, of course, Bill Watts, Wahoo McDaniel, Mass Superstar, Jimmy Valiant, King Kong Bundy, The Spoiler, Tully Blanchard, wow. Ric Flair, Terry Funk, Tommy Rich, Roddy Piper. Man, the legacy of this company. Yeah. Just the history here, these 20 years on TBS. That's a who's who, man. That's a real Hall of Fame. It really, it really is. And, and I, you know, you, you're honored to be a part just, uh, in a conversation with all those guys. I mean, because at one time, there's not a guy you mentioned that couldn't be considered as at the top of his game. That might have been the best at, at that era, in that year, that time, uh, as, as uh, anybody ever was. Uh, heels, maybe, even if they're a semi main event heel, if they're really good and they're helping draw money and they're having great matches, that's a success. Everybody doesn't have to work on top to be a winner. So, uh, I, 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 it was pretty damn impressive, but you got to also remember that that big old TV signal that went everywhere had a lot of muscle. And if you want to talk about, uh, the WCW failure to capitalize on the success in the UK, you can say the same thing about the superstation in general. That's a monster. Yeah. And I don't know that the monster was, was fed enough. Uh, throughout that era, uh, to earn its, I don't want to say earn its keep, but to, to accomplish what was potentially there in my opinion, anyway, let's talk about the next match. We got Ron Simmons pinning cactus Jack in eight minutes and 51 seconds to retain the WCW title. They did a great job with a Simmons video package here to make him seem like a world champion, but Meltzer would say once the match started, the illusion was over. Jack was hurting bad here and nowhere near his best. And Simmons wins with a power slam, a star in three quarters. It, it does feel like in this match, some of the wear and tear that cactus had put on his body is really starting to catch up with him a little bit, Yeah, but it's probably a styles clash too, these two guys, but I could see why Meltzer thought, man, this has got to be disappointing that this is your world champion. And maybe the work doesn't really clicked that day, but I, I don't know that it's an indictment on Ron's work as much as it is. Sometimes guys just have off gate off days. And if you're having, yeah. if you have a match with an opponent who is hurting, I mean, your, your odds are stacked against you, right? Yeah. And Jack was the kind of guy that, uh, well, Mick, whatever you want to call him, I call, I've called him a lot of things. Uh, he wasn't always real forthcoming about his injuries. So there's, he will, so in other words, you would never hear him talk about being sore, right? Cause he looked at it as soreness is a part of the game. And so being sore was not a negative thing. It was just being sore. And, uh, so sometimes you didn't really know where Mick stood physically in that regard, but they didn't have the chemistry on that night that we needed them to have. It was unfortunate. It was bad, bad time. You did, bad night to have an off night. During the course of the match, Ron Simmons uh, really kind of no sells a cactus Jack elbow off the apron onto the concrete. I know on the one hand, we're trying to make Simmons look strong, but on the other hand, yeah, you're kind of shitting on cactus here. Are we not? Well, it's just a greenness timing feel. Uh, you know, we said this about. We saw, talk about this and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the downfall of rest is they're put in positions before they're ready to accept those positions. We've talked about that three or four times here in the show. Eric Watts wasn't ready for his role and others we've discussed today that just weren't quite ready to get the ball. And, uh, I think that, that might've been the case there with Ronnie and, and so Ron need to work with a wrestling heel. Not a Mick was more maniacal, more brawler, you know, a different cat. So, uh, but he's got to sell and that just might've been a brain fart. This might've been instinctive. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, certainly Ron Simmons is a talented enough worker to know he's got to sell, especially something that devastating. So I want to mention the next match here, but before I do, I want to show, or I want to discuss what we're showing on TV here. It's the NWA title switch where Masa Chono beats Rick Rude over in Japan. And we're also showing that, Hey, Chono's coming over here. And I was always kind of surprised that Chono didn't make a bigger splash. He's a big guy. Yep. So it feels like he fits the American style of what they were looking yep. for. I mean, imagine him with a mouthpiece like Paulie dangerously. Mm -hmm. 
I could have really seen that work, but for whatever reason, it just didn't happen. Was he not yeah. interested in staying over or did they not see money in him? I think that the, one of the issues with him, he's such a major star in Japan, sticking to Chono. Yes. That available dates on him were fleeting. So it's hard to establish a storyline when you have random dates. Yeah. Uh, and that was, that was part of the issue with him, but he's a hell of a hand. He really was a hell of a hand. And you're right. He was underutilized in the story. He was, Chono was very underutilized in my estimation, uh, during that Watts era of WCW. Uh, he, he, and if Bill had got to know him and, or he knew him better, or he'd studied his, his videotapes, he would have seen what he had and he would have had a different, different philosoph creative uh, philosophy about how to book Chono. Chono was just Chono. <clears throat> it reminds me of how, uh, TNA used Okada, uh, back in the early days. And a lot of people don't even know that Okada was in TNA, but he was, and he was underutilized. Yeah. And, and what some people say somewhat disrespected, I don't know if that's true or not, but they just take it for granted. Young Japanese kid. Uh, and now look at him. He's as good as there is in the world. So, uh, and, and luckily I, I believe that somewhere down the, the road, and this is not coming from Tony Khan or anybody else. It just is logical to me with all the, with the ever building relationship with new Japan and, uh, AEW that somewhere down the road, we'll see Okada in an AEW ring for a big show. Why wouldn't we? Right. Uh, and so, uh, I know, uh, at least that's my, and that this may be fanboy and JR wanting to do some a amateur booking. Cause I really believe Okada's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And we got, and the guys like Kenny. And, and when Adam Cole gets back and, and there's a dozen Moxley, Moxley and Okada, I'm buying CM Punk and Okada. I'm going to, I want in, I want to call that I'm in, I'll be there. So, uh, I, I just think that there was language issues, date issues, but if we could have ever gotten that plan in place where there was a systematic way of entering and exiting WCW by these outside talents, uh, would have been a lot better off. We didn't have a good plan. We were supposed to have barbarian team up with, uh, Dan Spivey, but he had plans to go to Japan. So the story they tell on the show, <laughs> ironic, we're just talking about that is that cactus Jack called Spivey and told him to stay home. I'm bringing in butch Reed who knows more about Ron Simmons than anyone. So it's going to be barbarian and butch Reed taking on Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham and what a tag team they were. They go eight minutes and 13 seconds. Barbarian actually pins Wyndham after a foot to the face. Uh, Meltzer would say Rhodes took one great bump after missing a shoulder tackle. Wyndham sold the finish great, but it was just okay. Two stars. I could see how, you know, Rhodes and Wyndham could tear it up, but maybe Barbarian and Butch Reed weren't the right opponents here, but you're definitely getting a flavor for what Cowboy likes, right? I, I think so, but they weren't ready. They weren't ready for a big time event on TV. Right. They had no story. They had no angle. It was cold. And when you're dealing with a cold product in a, in a very, even as cold overall product, in other words, we weren't setting the world on fire to start with. So you bring in two guys who are both good hands. Uh, you know, a lot of respect for those guys, but they didn't have any buildup. There was no build. There's no anticipation built for this situation. And, uh, so. Another case of booking things when, before they were ready to go and the fans reacted by silence. Next up, we've got Rick rude and Jake Roberts and big van Vader and the super invader who's Hercules Hernandez taking on sting the Steiners <laughs> I didn't know that. and Koloff in an elimination tag match, which goes 15 minutes and 15 seconds. This is a big time match. Rick and Vader are going to work hot spots together and, uh, they're the highlight of the match. According to Meltzer. And he even says the highlight of the whole card, the first fall would see Koloff pinned in seven twenty six, after Jake pinned him after, uh, he collided with rude sting would then pin invader in 36 seconds with a face buster for the second fall. The third fall is back to Vader and Rick Steiner and they're trading power moves. And Rick tries to stand up with Vader on his shoulders, but 395 pounds of dead weight. Staring at the bottom made this a bad idea. Uh, at, <laughs> at least he didn't tear out his lower back because with that much weight and it gets shaky, that's pretty dangerous. According to Meltzer, 
Scott's going to get DQ'd in three minutes and 32 seconds for coming off the top with a clothesline on Vader. That's a DQ in Bill Watts, WCW. And they attempt the road warrior finisher, but Rick couldn't get Vader up. So Rick is counted out in 55 <laughs> seconds and they give rude a neck breaker on the floor, which leaves sting against three. So rude and sting are both on the mat. Vader comes off the top and accidentally splashes both men. So now Vader's DQ'd and sting and rude are left for dead. And the crowd starts chanting DDT DDT and Roberts drag rude over to the corner, tagged in and gets the pin with the DDT in 46 seconds. Meltzer loved it, called it the best match on the card and gave it three wow. and a quarter stars on paper. It looks odd. But boy, it worked and they were buying it that day. Were they not? Yeah. Maybe they're just ready for something because it sounds your description sounds a little herky jerky. Yes. And, uh, it, it didn't seem like there was a, uh, any, uh, obvious attempts to build continuity, tell a story because things kept happening. Boom, boom, boom. And maybe that's what, maybe that's what that show needed because they, they hadn't reacted this way yet. And there'd been some pretty good talent in the ring prior to this, uh, cluster let's uh let's talk about jake here for a minute i mean he's the top heel mm -hmm. but the crowd's chanting dd star he's star conrad and there he came go. from the other guys uh in a good spot main events with a variety of big time talents so he was perceived to be a star and the snake was this the snake itself was a great uh, prop unique different so, uh, I think people just looked at Jake as a, he's a big star coming to wrestle for in our company in this company. And uh, I think that's a difference there. Uh, he was a care. If, if anything, he would have been described by some of my, uh, mentors as a character baby face. He's going to cheat and beat you if he can, or he has to, uh, he's got a mean streak and he's got an ugly way about him, but boy, he's really good. And that DDT is the best. And now the DDT in a lot of places is a high spot, which is sad. I don't want to get started on that topic. Let's talk about, um, you know, the, the packages that they did here, the observer would say lots of features showing everyone from buzz Sawyer to Jack and Jerry Briscoe to flair and Piper and DiBiase, blah, 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 blah. Give them credit for not showing anyone in a bad light, even though many of the men achieved their greatest fame with the WWF or in the case of flair had literally just won their title. Among those who were introduced that were there were Thunderbolt Patterson, who would have been embarrassing, except his interview was mercifully short. Mr. Wrestling two from video from Hawaii, which shows they did work hard to put this show together. Right. Bruno San Martino, who did an interview with a less than slight knock at the WWF bullet, Bob Armstrong, Ted Turner, and Andre, the giant, uh, Hank Aaron's also there as well as former announcer, Freddie Miller, and they had a poll on the top rope rule and 88% voted it down, which means they'll obviously be repealing the rule. If they haven't already Meltzer would say, I enjoyed this more than most shows, but I wasn't left with a positive feeling about the company's future. All these charismatic guys like Cornette, flair, Piper road warriors, etc., in 15 seconds seemed to get over better and came off more as superstars than almost any of the current guys. And the crowd was only about 500 deep at center stage. Or half full. And when you've got the 20th anniversary and you've got all this morale stuff going on, and then you show up where all the Turner executives are there and we can't even fill up a thousand seater, it's got to be disheartening, dude. What do you remember about that day? It's disheartening, dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, it's, it's just disheartening. Yeah. You worked your ass off and you think you got a good theme and you know, I thought those packages were excellent. I love that kind of stuff. Anyway. Uh, yeah, it's, it is disheartening and it's, I can see where morale could be bad because you're playing games. These guys are playing games. Uh, they're working matches and they're not getting over. So yeah, it's disheartening. Let's, um, let's talk about Andre, the giant. Uh, this is his last appearance that we're, that he's ever going to have on TV. Not just for WCW, but the WWF just in wrestling. This is his final appearance and it's a big deal to have Andre there. Did you get any time with, uh, the big man? Is this a major coup to have one of Vince's oh. guys here like this? 
major coup. Yeah. Cause it was because of Andre status globally. Yes. You know, I think we, we marry Andre to Vince's company to the WWE and, and for good reason, I get that, but it wasn't as if he only was a star in WWE. He was a star everywhere. And, uh, so yeah, having Andre there was, was uh, significant. You could tell he was in bad shape. You could tell he didn't want to converse. Uh, he, he wanted to find where the bar was and they got into the bar, they had a bar there and had him in place to sit. And I'm not so sure we didn't even do his. I don't know if we did his interview outside on the entrance way or at the bar, but, uh, he had to get off his feet. He couldn't stand up very long. And, and, uh, that's a, that's a challenging. I can prompt from experience near, here lately. Uh, so uh, he didn't, he wasn't real chatty Conrad. He wasn't real. Ch- I don't think he felt good. I think, and I think one of the reasons he came in was for cowboy. The fact that cowboy always used him well in the mid South. He always had top matches with guys he'd like to hang with. So everything about Andre's booking in mid South was done was tailor made just for Andre. You know, he liked Popeye's chicken. I got him plenty of Popeye's chicken in my time. One of my early jobs, uh, and, and booze. And so, and he had a, pl- a cowboy flew him around a cowboy's plane. So he didn't have to make car trips. He loved working there. And so, uh, uh, that was, I think why Andre was there, but you could tell if it had been such a special occasion and he was, what he was, I think doing is repaying an old friend of debt, maybe. Yeah. Or thank you, uh, that, uh, he wouldn't have showed up. I don't think he could have made it. I don't even, I can't remember how he got him there. I think we might've drove him from Charlotte area. If we had his farm to Atlanta, I can't remember. There's something story about that. Uh, and I'm not sure Siri flew, but I might be wrong. Meltzer would say the positive was that the show did a 3.7 and a 6.1 share. So it was viewed in 2.19 million homes. The rating was the same as last September's uh, clash, which was headlined by the world tag team title tournament won by the enforcers. It was only the 17th highest out of the 20th or 20 clashes. But Meltzer says everybody probably had to be doing cartwheels seeing that the show peaked for the eight man with a 4.3 rating and a 7.1 share. That means 2.57 million homes. Uh, Cactus Jack and Ron Simmons also did a 4.3 for 2.54 million homes. And these days, Jim, when we talk about millions, when it comes to ratings, we're talking about people, not houses. So this is a, a big dog on deal. What do you remember about the rating? Do you remember feeling, I don't know. I think everybody, everybody was we, somewhat celebratory, but then following that, if you've been around the business very much, Conrad, you, then your next thought is now, what do we do? What's next? Who got over in that show that we can build on? Where are we headed? And so I think there's, cause we knew that we were just beginning a rebuilding journey that no one knew exactly how, how it was going to, uh, end up, how it was going to, you know, how it was going to finish, what will be the finish of this angle. So, you know, but we have more work to do, but I think everybody was happy and, uh, it was somewhat celebratory, but nothing off the page. It wasn't a two day celebration or anything like that, but it was nice to get a win. I I want to mention that after the show was over, I'll just read it from the observer after the show was a well-produced video plugging sting versus Jake Roberts, spin the wheel, make the deal main event for Halloween havoc on October 25th in Philadelphia. While the video was great and Robert's performance was even better. It made no sense. Given the direction, the company is supposedly taking wrestling. That would have been awesome in the WWF where feuds are more spoofy or Japan where they don't revolve around personal hatred, but for an angle revolving around personal hatred, it's hard to believe two guys could be together for literally hours that it would take to put this piece of film together. Of course, this is the silly shit where they're in a bar and there's a little person. Cause there's always a little person and Jake starts shooting laser beams with his fucking eyes. I mean, it's out there and it doesn't feel like a bill Watts initiative at all. It but wasn't, I think it's a Sharon Sadello thing, but it, it was, it's fascinating to me that we're not, we're not going off the top rope. That's hokey shit. Now, Jake, get your laser eyes ready. What? <laughs> that's crazy. And here it is. Yeah. yeah it's, it's crazy. And it, you're adding to my misery. 
<laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, made no sense. But they, again, there were, there were constant movements and various fronts and referendums to be more like WWE. In a way, that's not a bad idea because they were, you know, ultra successful and going public again or eventually and all that stuff. But man, it's just, we, it wasn't a matter that's not a bad idea or a bad concept to try to be more like the number one, the world's number one leader. But golly, in the way we were doing it was embarrassing. It's embarrassing. So, uh, do you remember these when Vader came out of the ocean? Yes. Same management did that. Yeah. Same people. So it, it was a matter that there were some, uh, folks there with, uh, you know, Navy blue sport coats and white shirts and, and red ties that believe that, uh, they knew enough about the wrestling business. Cause they've been around the boys enough and the other people in wrestling that they couldn't be very smart. So I can do this. And that's kind of where we were on that thing. So it was, it was horrible. And I think cowboy just did it as a, he didn't want to fight the, the tide on that issue. Is it, that, is it a, such a big deal? Is this the hill you want to die on cowboy? Man, eh, probably not. That's how I looked at it. You're talking about a vignette here. Yes. That's all. So, uh, you know, let it go. Let's, uh, let's do one more question. And then we want to talk about what we're doing next week. Uh, Joey wants to know. With all due respect, how is it that Mick ended up having a better career than Ron Simmons? That is interesting. Cause I think in this era, people would have thought that Simmons would be the guy who shook out and had the bigger career. Why? Cause he ran a fashion 40 and he could bench fresh three twenty five, thirty 30 times and all that. Well, all we're talking about physicality. Yeah. We're talking about measurements. You can't measure a guy's passion or his heart or his, his in ring intellect. And Foley had all those things in spades over just about anybody you want to talk about. So yeah, there was a, it was just a different, he had different DNA. It was just Mick. It's something I saw that was breaking my arm, patting my, breaking my arm, patting myself on the back, but God damn, I always believed, believed in him. Right. And, uh, and it, and it worked out for everybody involved, but, uh, I think that's, that's a such situation there. If you're saying, how could Ron Simmons be such a much better athlete than Mick Foley, but not have the career that Mick had. Well, you've answered your question. It's not always about the athletics. It's not always about your eight by 10. It's about you delivering bell to bell and on that mic. And in there, all those situations, none of us can say, well, Mick didn't live up to his promise. No, he did every time. Absolutely. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, that's like saying Ron Simmons, Ron Simmons was a three-time all American nose tap. He played, he played in the, on the, right over the center in the middle of the defensive line. Of course, violent, it's a different world there. But if you said, well, I'm going to put Ron Simmons at tailback. Well, that might not work. He might not be the tailback that you're looking for. He's a great middle linebacker or a nose guard, maybe the best in the business. But so I, I, I think that we're looking at two different things there, but, uh, it also says something else. Nick Foley was damn sure special. He still is special human being wise. Uh, and I know we're going to see Mick soon, which is always fun. And, uh, I always like the way he dresses up for all these affairs and functions. <laughs> Absolutely. So it'll be fun to see him, but it was just a different, different ball players. He's just a different dude, man. And we're going to see that different dude this Saturday, money for mongo.com. Check it out on fight. We hope you guys can watch this live or on demand. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty pumped about this opportunity to raise some money for Mongo. Is there going to be cursing and drinking going on? Well, we're going to be there, right? <laughs> yeah. Go check it out. I think you're going to dig it. It's moneyformongo.com. And don't forget, it's straight donation, folks. It all goes straight to Mongo. No haircuts. And, and, and what an easy domain, too. If you want to raise some money for Mongo, go to moneyformongo.com. <laughs> uh, it's almost like jrsbbq.com because I see yes. over there, buddy, we got everything we need at my house. We got the sauce, we got the jerky. We got the main event mustard. We got Chipotle ketchup, but the seasoning, I keep talking about it and I'll keep talking about it. I love the seasoning. Everybody does. It's all purpose. And we've put that shit to the test. All purpose. Indeed goes with your eggs, goes with your popcorn, goes with your steak, your chicken, your fish. It's fantastic, Jim. 
Somebody texted me. Thank you, Conrad. Somebody texted me a picture uh, of a beautiful sliced tomato, fresh out of their garden. And on that tomato was JR seasoning. I love it. And the guy said, it's, you, you can't believe how good it is. Nice, crisp, cool tomato sliced. And then a little JR's magic dust on that uh, tomato and you're in heaven. So it's all good. I love the pictures. Uh, you guys send me, tweet me pictures of uh, stuff that you eat or you cook of our, our products. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to, I'm in Oklahoma now and I'm getting ready to, here, when we're finished with this, I'm going to sign uh, a bunch of books and some other things that uh, need my attention. So, uh, we're, it's, it's hard to run a business in two different States, two different areas, but now the football's near, I'll be in Oklahoma more. And, uh, so we'll be able to keep up with stuff a little bit better. I, uh, I can't wait to talk about next week's show. I love talking 1997 with you next week's going to be fantastic. We're talking ground zero 1997. It's the September show 25 years ago. We're building towards that unbelievable hell in a cell match with undertaker and Shawn Michaels. We're going to talk about DX forming Sean turning heel, Steve Austin's injury, the Patriot in and his big, big, biggest and most high pro easy for me to say most high profile feud so far with Bret Hart, uh, right. Farouk will be taking on crush and Savio Vega in a three way of what's left of the nation of domination. Brian Pillman is going to be working with gold dust. And I think this is his last pay-per-view. And of course, good old Jr. gets stunned for the very first time. That sure son of a bitch. <laughs> it's going to be fun, man. I, there's a lot to talk about in September of 97. A I lot took the, to talk I took about. the most, uh, awkward, clumsy cow on ice stunner in the history of wrestling. Uh, the only person that did it worse than me was maybe Vince's first one or two. Uh, but, uh, and little did I, little did we know what those stunners are going to mean to a lot of different careers moving forward, which I'm, I'll, I'll get, I'm going to have fun talking about that. So it was good. Uh, you know, I'm uh, just not my forte. I, I I've always been leery of getting those physical things, Conrad, because I don't think I'm very good at it. And I don't want to embarrass myself and take time away from the real wrestlers. So, uh, anyway, it'll be fun to talk about that again. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we hope you guys will consider checking us out this weekend. Moneyformongo.com. That's moneyformongo.com. And, uh, Hey, if you want some BBQ, I know where to go. JR's BBQ.com has got you hooked up. Jim and I are going to be uh, trying to get ahead as much as we can. You're going to get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com, including these once in a lifetime opportunities once a year, we get everybody together and leave your wallet at home, man. Well, unless you're wanting to donate for Mongo. Uh, because we're going to have a lot of fun this weekend with top guy weekend. Hope you guys will join us. And if you can't, for whatever reason, just, uh, keep up online. It's over at ad free shows, but money for Mongo, man, type it in your browser, go take a look and consider donating to a guy who gave us a lot of great memories. Yep. And he really needs our help right now. He needs a friend. He needs lots of friends and just a simple act of reaching out folks for a guy in his position is incredible. Yes. Can't tell you how, what it means to, to him. And so it's incredible. And, and when you give, you, you get shocked sometimes about, about what it means to you because you're doing something good from your heart with no agenda. And uh, I think that we need to be doing more of that stuff in our world today, but in any, any event, that's another, that's another sad song for another, another time, Conrad, my boy, <laughs> oh, my boy. We'll see you guys next week, right here on grilling Jr. With the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Thanks, everybody. See you in Chicago.